of course, I had to ask the uh, so the, it, it's a, uh, a a real robo race, so just uh, uh, robotic cars racing each other. And I said, well, everybody would want to see the humans race the robots, but uh, unfortunately, the robo vehicles can operate uh, their uh, wheels independently, which is something a human is not currently enabled to do in the cockpit of a car. And so that represents, uh, what, a two-second per lap advantage? That's right, yep. Yeah, so forget about humans racing robots, uh, at least today. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, please take it away, Brent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for uh, staying for this afternoon. So you may have seen our car is just outside. I'll give you a little bit of context as to why the car's here and, and what we're all about. Um, I think when we, when we look at motorsport, motorsport's always played a role uh, in showcasing new technology and developing new technology. The, the picture you see here from 1894 was the first uh, race. That was a, a road race from Paris to Rouen. And I like to talk about that because actually it, it proves two things. It proves that the technology could run that distance, that actually a combustion car could go that far, but it does so in the real environment. So it actually has to, has to do that through the real traffic situations. And that builds trust in the public. When you can see the technology perform in the way that you imagine it deployed, it builds trust. Um, and then this is where I want to show you where we've got to with motorsport uh, at the moment. At the this was in Macau two years ago, that as we go on showcasing now, like the pinnacle of technology the for automotive. Ben. Doesn't look as though there's major damage to the car, but we'll keep you informed as to whether... Oh, no! Oh, mayhem! And Not necessarily what we want to be communicating as a community. Of of here if you look, we're still Mikey using Macau. flags. And within motorsport to indicate when there's accidents I've ever occurring. seen here. You see the first car after this car crashes. This first car around. Every other car, not so much, but every other car is um, proceeding, expecting the road ahead to be clear. And that's why I think communications is really important. So if you want to see beyond your, your field of view, the vision that you have, whether you're a human, whether you're an autonomous vehicle with LIDARs or radars, if you want to see around corners, connectivity becomes really important. And that's why we're here today. Um, just also want to show you a little bit, um, just to show you that the car's real. I'll skip over this video. But we are building robots, uh, intelligent machines, robots that like to drive, robots that want to race. We actually have two vehicles. So the, the vehicle at the top is DevBot. We have Robocar here on display. Um, but just to show you that the car's actually real, it's not just a rendering or it's not just a mock-up. This was at the Goodwood Festival of Speed in the summer last year. It's a famous hill climb event. It was to celebrate their 25th anniversary. The car itself is driving fully autonomously in this environment. It's in front of, I think, 60,000 people. We did a demonstration every day. Every time the car got to the top of the hill, all of the crowd cheered and clapped, which is crazy. I don't know who they were clapping for. There's no driver in there. Maybe it's our achievement, but I think it is something unique. So Goodwood, you celebrate all of the motorsport technology from the very beginning. Obviously, this was the first time they'd seen an autonomous car. We were the first to complete that lap, uh, complete the climb. Um, the car itself is fitted with five LiDAR sensors. Uh, it has two at the front, two like wing mirrors, one at the rear. It's got two radar sensors, one at the front, one at the rear. Six machine vision cameras, three at the front, two like wing mirrors, one at the rear. It has a GPS inertial system inside the car, which we can use for uh, highly accurate positioning. So combined, we can get down to centimeter level accuracy on the positioning that we have. But really the competition that we're setting now is a software competition. It's a championship of intelligence. So we provide the standard hardware platform. Teams compete by writing the software that drives the car. If you write better software, you will drive better. And that's really the focus of our competition. It's all about software development. So I'm sure okay. we'll pick up on that. Very good. Our presentation. Now we'll find out uh, who gets their name pulled out of the hat with the next presentation up. Okay. It's Max. It's got to be Max. Max. Yeah. And introduce yourself, Max, please. Yes, I can. I can drop this. 
Welcome to the Should have gotten a Mac. Mm -hmm. Can Ben smack? Yeah. Like that or? <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Max Cavazzini from uh, Amazon Web Services. I'm running the automotive for Europe, Middle East and Africa at AWS. Uh, very briefly, I mean, if you think about Amazon as a company, uh, you recognize that we have been using AI for years. I mean, it's now more than 20 years that we use AI and machine learning especially. Uh, to run business and to create new experiences. Uh, you see Amazon Go, which is our um, stores where you just go, pick up your stuff, go away without any cashier, without any queue, just pick up your stuff and go, which is mixing AI sensor fusion like an autonomous car is doing. You have Alexa which is using AI to do voice interaction. You have Kiva robots that are using AI to autonomously decide where to go into a fulfillment center. And then more, I mean, Prime Air, there are drones, self-flying electric drones. Um, so AI, it's, it's in our DNA, but what does AWS stands in automotive? And the reason why I'm here and I'm working in, uh, in the automotive space, I have an automotive background, it's because what we see is that basically OEMs needs, need to become software companies. And as AWS, we are enabling them to build their own solution and to leverage technology to make sure that, you know, not only autonomous, now it's more about connected car and electric, and autonomous driving testing, it's sure. So we created an entire platform to cover the flow on vehicle development, ingesting data, petabyte of data that are created for cars running. How do you collect them? How do you clean them? How do you move them to the cloud to allow high performance computing? Uh, we announced with Toyota, an example, they are running the entire high performance computing. So their autonomous driving model in the cloud to go 40% faster. Mobileye, it's working with us. Some of these guys are working with us. So the ability to provide the right blocks is what is making AWS automotive business right now. One example, uh, and then I leave to the other panelists. Uh, this is TU Simple, level four autonomous driving trucks. So they're using us to build their system. It's L4, again, uh, it's not L2, not L5, uh, the target today. And they are running their simulations in the cloud, both for the day, this is real time, so real-time analytics or video, real-time tagging, and working also overnight with, uh, I would say, quite a good precision. So the software allows to speed up development. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Uh, I think, Anne, you're up. Okay, so my presentation was not autonomous enough and didn't <laughs> reach there, but uh, I will do it without, um, no worry. So my name is Anne Melano, I'm the co-founder and VP operation of Pesmile. We are a Swiss company located in Lausanne, uh, a bit further on the lake, and we started back in 2012. Um, dealing stuff with autonomous vehicles because we were involved in uh, some European projects demonstrating autonomous autonomous shuttles uh, in European cities. 
And at that time, we received six vehicles on the campus of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, and we had to do something with them. And we realized quite early that even if these were only prototypes and very first type of autonomous vehicles, um, there was something missing. The full industry was just focusing on how to make the best autonomous vehicles with embedded hardware, embedded software. But the real question that arises at that time is, okay, if tomorrow, if, if today you have the perfect autonomous vehicles here and we have to do something with it, what will we do? What is the goal of these autonomous vehicles? Do we just want to continue having one vehicle per people and to just replace our individual vehicle by individual autonomous ones? Is this really a solution? Is this the way we want to use the technology? And we believe that autonomous vehicles will bring much more flexibility and really help the shift from the ownership economy to the shared economy. So we need, and when I say we, it's not us, it's mobility service providers need to be able to manage autonomous vehicles in real time, remotely, to bring some real services to the users. And another complexity on top of that is that what I just said will never happen like this. The transition phase toward autonomous vehicles will be very long. And even if some people here can tell you it will be in one year, two years, or 25 years, we need to do something with this transition period. We need to give the tools to mobility service operators to be able to manage together today conventional vehicles and tomorrow autonomous ones. So what we do at Best Mile is that we develop a cloud software, a B2B software for mobility service operators. It's a fleet orchestration software. If I had to summarize it in a few words, our goal is just to send the right mission to the right vehicle at the right time. If you remove the drivers, you need to take a lot of decisions in real time to be sure that your full fleet is optimized. So this is what we do. We have been involved in projects with different types of autonomous vehicles since 2014. We are also deploying systems with normal human-driven vehicles, but with people who have the ambition to, to transition towards autonomous vehicles. And we enable any type of anti-man mobility. So from riding and micro transit to autonomous shuttles and robot taxi. That's it. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Philippe, you're up. And, and uh, I do find it very interesting that here, here at, at this show where it's such a supercar show and a car enthusiast event, the Geneva Motor Show, uh, the city is actively discouraging you from bringing your car to Geneva. Uh, <laughs> so enjoy the public transit <clears throat> and introduce yourself, uh, Philippe. Th th thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank thanks for being here. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, and um, my name is Philippe Heismans, and I'm a VP of growth at RideCell. At RideCell, we, we power some of the uh, highest utilization of mobility services in the world, services run by uh, operators like BMW and about 20 uh, operators and car sharing and ride sharing services. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about sort of our vision of, of quick, quickly talk to you about uh, our vision of the path to autonomy and uh, the progress uh, needed to get there. And so for mobility as a, uh, sorry, it's going the wrong way here. For mobility as a service to, to truly happen, uh, you know, these, these three uh, elements uh, need need to come in play, and you could argue shared and electric are already here, uh, and 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 the big uh, question is is uh, autonomous. Obviously, shared. If you look in uh, in Switzerland, um, car sharing service like um, Mobility uh, is is already uh, functioning very well and since a long time, and all the ride sharing services like uh, Uber, Lyft, Didi, and Ola. Uh, so the shared has happened. Uh, electric uh, is really starting to happen now in a meaningful way with EVs you know, starting to, to come into the market. And the big question is autonomy. Uh, you know, it, we know it will happen, but when? In five years? In 10? Uh, under what circumstances? And do we just wait? Well, fortunately, you know, we, we, we don't have to, uh, to wait for the future to build it. And a path to that future is today operating 
uh, fleets. Uh, so the, the shared element, because everything you do when you operate a fleet, uh, which is learning about maintenance, learning about marketing, this is will be invaluable for leading uh, autonomous services tomorrow. That's also why you're seeing uh, a lot of interest, you know, maybe on the on the sidelines of the show, but all the OEMs are are very much looking into the next page of autonomous. And what we obviously say is autonomous fleets are the future. Because the question is, will it be individual autonomous cars or large shared electric fleets? We 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 think it will be more of the of the latter. And talking about electric, um, obviously uh, EV fleets is, is the next step. Electric electric is a future for many environmental reasons. Reduce pollution in cities if electricity is produced in a greener way. Reduce pollution worldwide. That's obviously a target for all of us. Um, and uh, electric uh, vehicles also uh, love the idea of fleets, or they, they, they're a, v a perfect pairing. And, and w why do I say that? Because there's a obviously a, a, a bit higher cost uh, initially for acquiring an electric vehicle, and the cost of maintenance is, is low. So if you look at you know fleet operators that buy hundreds of vehicles, they can bring the cost, the acquisition cost down, and the operation cost is really what what matters for them uh, in the long run. So again, electric, and if you think about it, autonomous, where the cars are going to be even more expensive uh, with all the all the radars needed to, to drive, um, are also going to be very well adapted and suited to fleet management in the future. And so what we what we really see is we the, the two biggest costs today of operating a fleet are maintenance, and that includes cleaning, uh, uh, recharging the electric cars. Uh, maintenance and repair, and uh, repositioning the cars. Because if you're if you're doing a car sharing service, for instance, it's very important to reposition the cars from cold zones to hot zones where people can actually take them. Um, that's a that's about a quarter of the cost. And the other another quarter, by the way, similar magnitude is marketing. Obviously, you have to invest a lot in marketing to get new users to your service. So these are two very important uh, things that you learn. And what do we think as the next step is autonomous? We think autonomous will happen step by step, and we think it's going to be without rides in the beginning. Because I just explained that maintenance is is super important. There's a lot of use cases that we see for autonomous cars repositioning themselves, autonomous cars going to the recharging station by themselves, etc. And and this, why is this important? Well, for for two reasons. One is the biggest hurdle for running autonomy will probably be legal and insurance. Because people will say it's sort of a chicken and egg problem. There's not enough proof that, th that this is safe to have uh, sort of a machine driving a human. In, it's, it's completely unknown, right? So the best way is to have autonomous vehicles drive through their charging station between 2 AM. And this is a, this is a near term use cases that we see is basically low speed urban areas, uh, le level four aut autonomy, and no passengers. So the example, typical example is in, in a city like San Francisco, between 2 and 6 a.m., you could reposition your cars for pickup the next morning to go to the cleaning station and the refueling station. And this is a great way to lead the path to autonomy because you basically have the safety track record that's being built and the people getting used to autonomy on their streets without drivers. And then these cars switch to being driven afterwards. Um, we actually do that at, at RideCell. Real quick about RideCell, we also have an autonomous division in-house. We acquired Oro late 2017, and we work on these near-term autonomy use cases. And we have a, a public permits to, 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 to do uh, to public testing in California. We uh, are also better known for basically the, the ride-sharing and, and car-sharing platforms that we offer to operators and, and fleet management. And maybe just a quick last word about RightCell as a company. If you want to know RightCell, where does the name come from? It came from the early beginnings where it was order a ride on your cell phone. So that's basically the, 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 the genesis in, in, in the ride sharing space. Um, and it was founded in 2009, headquartered in San Francisco with, with uh, presence in four European countries, you know, quickly growing here. Also in Asia, we now have 150 employees. We just finished our Series B round of 60 million with a lot of you know, great investors that you can see here. A call out for our European investors would be Deutsche Bahn, 
BMW, um, BNP Paribas, uh, and Munich Re, uh, and um, and also large scale customers like uh, AAA, BMW, Ferrovial, and Renault. So so this is uh, basically in a nutshell uh, what we do. And happy to take questions afterwards. Excited to be in this space. Thanks. Okay. So, Alain, uh, I think it's your turn. Uh, and now, Alain, uh, 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 please introduce yourself. And uh, Alain uh, is threatening to have a provocative slide for us uh, here today. And I, I think it's, I, I think there's plenty of opportunity for provocation, because I think what you're seeing in, in these presentations and at this event is what I like to call uh, some very aggressive radical creative destruction in the automotive industry. We are completely threatening our existing business models with all, with all of these new technologies. Uh, I'll try to just make a couple quick comments. I'm a professor at Princeton, been there. This is my 47th year on the faculty, so I know nothing else except academics. I don't like the name. I don't like level one, two, three, four, five. Um, I call them smart driving cars. Um, there's a lot of confusion. There are only three kinds. There might only be two. There are safe driving cars. So if you talk about safety, it's safe driving cars you're talking about, um, not any of the other stuff. There's the Teslas of this world, which are the self-driving cars, which give us the opportunity to take our hands off the wheel and feet off the brake sometimes and maybe use our cell phones. So therefore, we're going to buy them. And then the third one is a driverless. And those guys are uh, mobility machines. And I had a couple other slides. What I hate is safe driving cars. This is a speedometer in my car, um, 160 miles an hour. Are they kidding out here? I mean, really, where can I do 160 miles an hour in Jersey? I mean, this, this is like crazy. And so, okay, sure, there's the Autobahn over here, but what about the rest of us in this world? The, uh, uh, the car should be limited to, you know, speed kills anyway. Um, this is a safe driving car. It allows us to misbehave when we're down there, uh, but yet it has all the, uh, all the gizmos and all the, uh, uh, the um, uh, tools and LIDARs and whatevers uh, to keep us from running into the shelves. Okay, we can do the donuts, we can misbehave. I mean, everybody out here on this floor is, is trying to get us to misbehave, and we're just trying to get to someplace. Uh, so if we're really talking about safety, uh, uh, let's put those things there, but keep us from misbehaving because, because that, that, that's what hurts us. When is this gonna happen? Safety hasn't sold. Why hasn't safety sold? Why? Because all the stuff that we put in the cars to make them safe and not kill us ended up costing more. The airbags, the, even the seat belts, the crush zones all cost more. Hey, if we don't go bang anymore, guess what? The cost goes down. If that cost goes down, then the expected um, present net present value or the expected liability is less than the cost of the technology. And if that happens, then there's an insurance company that will decide to make money off of the loss, losses and savings of those losses. And it becomes the Amazon of this business and gets us to all buy it. That hasn't happened yet. We know the Tesla has been out here. They're not giving it for free to give us that comfort, convenience and so on. Uh, and auto companies love selling that. They're going to stay in business. That business model is going to say, stay, as I like to call it. It's the new chrome and fins of the automotive industry. Um, then there's a driverless. And the driverless is really, you know, has no steering wheel, has no, no pedals. And it is a mobility machine. That's what it is. And, and, and really what it is is... Uh, it's not that we're going to own it. I think all these things are a real embarrassment. Uh, they're an elitist tool that somehow we're going to go in there and sip our cocktails as we're doing da da da. And the amount of, of, of quality of life improvements that we're going to get out of those things compared to already we have a Bentley convertible. I mean, geez, you know, or e epsilon. However, to a whole other 
population. Those things, that mobility machine, instead of serving maybe five trips a day, serves 50. And there are a lot of folks out there that could really use it. We heard some of it before, and that's where in the heck that should be used. And where that's going to be used is in a business model that goes out there and really provides mobility to the mobility disadvantage and basically makes money off of that. And that's not selling these things in, in uh, dealerships. It's really creating uh, 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 companies that, in fact, uh, use these as fleets and fleet operators to provide that mobility. So uh, those are the important folks. In the, in, and I really do want to emphasize that the mobility disadvantage, they're the young, they're the old, they're the ones that are physically disabled, but they're the poor. And there's nobody out here talking about providing mobility to the poor. And if you look at the poor, they've been left behind. The transit services don't serve them. Uh, and that's that's here in Switzerland, as well as in Princeton, New Jersey, as well as all over the United States. Mass transit serves 4% of the trips. It, it's an embarrassment. And whereas these could go out and serve the population, which is probably representative in the United States of 15% of the households, and that's where the value proposition is. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Okay, Julian. Sorry, you had to hold back so much, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's a discussion. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julien Masson. Uh, I'm uh, in charge of business development and sales for Cloudcar. Um, I've got five slides, right? So okay. not a 30 minute speech, I promise. Uh, we Cloudcar, Cloudcar was founded in 2011. So it was a startup. We like to say we are now a scale up. Um, and uh, we were based in the Silicon Valley. We are growing our execution in China. And our mission is to, we, we deliver cloud-based infotainment services, uh, but our mission is to deliver a seamless, uh, relevant, and personalized uh, digital experience for vehicle occupants, um, while really enabling OEMs, car manufacturers, to um, yeah, stay in control and not give away everything to the big ones of, uh, of uh, the software world today. So if, um, if you look at the current uh, in-vehicle connected services approaches that we've seen in the market since a couple of years, um, a lot of the cars still on the floor today uh, are showing individual apps uh, on the infotainment systems. Um, and so, it was the early approach to uh, application uh, integration into the, the, the vehicle cockpit. And there they are goods and bads around it. Um, and one of the bads typically is that, OK, a vehicle is not a smartphone on wheel. And you, you, have, you, you don't necessarily want to, to touch a user interface and end up into a full screen HMI to, to deal with Spotify, Deezer. Um, and some of those apps are, are actually depreciated, and OEMs have not done great in, in maintaining those solutions. What, what has definitely rolled out in the market is this second approach where the end user is, they are bringing their own uh, ecosystem in the car with uh, Android Auto projected mode, with Apple CarPlay, some other solutions in China. So the benefits of those are uh, definitely to, yeah, the end user is bringing his own ecosystem in the car cockpit. The big inconvenience, is that your? I don't know if you are using those in your car. I am, and uh, the the challenge is that you're always swapping from one world to the other. You're with Apple CarPlay, you can do some some stuff, and then you go back on the on the built-in uh, infotainment system. And for the OEM, the downside of that is that there's a few opportunities or uh, touch points uh, for the OEM to to talk to the end user, to the, the vehicle occupants. So what we are focusing on at Cloud Car is to um, we, we, we have, we've done a heavy work on um, aggregating a lot of content and service providers which are relevant for the in-cockpit experience. And we've, we try to uh, really abstract these content and services from the HMI. So we decoupled those service providers from the HMI itself um, so that uh, those services are all cloud-based. You can activate them, uh, deactivate them remotely from the cloud. And uh, the OEMs can still manage their own HMI and the whole service experience so that they can 
uh, give access to a lot of the big ecosystems uh, of this world, but they can still be part of that game and not give away everything to, to Google. Um, I mentioned it, sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, we, we are a white label platform and uh, our aim is really to give some control to the OEM of this digital ecosystem. We, um, we activate, deactivate services uh, and content from the cloud without massive over the -air software updates on, on this infotainment system. We can manage the, the regional difference uh, from the cloud without 54 variants uh, at this OEM group to manage the whole world in terms of software variants. There are opportunities for service monetization. It's not, uh, it's, I mean, it's hard, it's not easy, but there are opportunities and we enable those opportunities. We store, uh, the, we create profiles for the vehicle occupants uh, and we store them GDPR compliant uh, in our cloud platform so that you can actually find back uh, your profile into that second car that you're going to use with whatever mobility as a service uh, program. We are agnostic to the natural language uh, understanding technology used in the car. This is a challenge. We need to talk about that together. Um, but that's really our aim. And we work today with the big ones, with, uh, with Nuance, uh, 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 with uh, uh, some specific ones in, in China. And we, we are not developing our own natural language understanding. It wouldn't make sense, but we need to cooperate and work with, with uh, the big ones. And obviously, all of that makes sense only if we have the ability to use vehicle data. Because um, uh, I'll, 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 why why how to deliver a personalized user experience into that car, you need to know and predict what's going, what's going on for that car, where the car is heading to, how many occupants are sitting in, into that car. And uh, to, so those vehicle data are very useful to build a context uh, and have the software running in the cloud, predicting what's going on to develop, to develop, uh, provide a, a personalized, personalized uh, experience. So how we do that, uh, we, we do the hard and uh, not funny job of keeping interfaces with multiple service providers in, in multimedia domain, in location domain, in productivity domains uh, up to date. Uh, and we abstract uh, those content and service providers so that you don't need to have uh, 10 different uh, media streaming application, but you can have one media player and all these applications are available in one experience, one domain. The same for places, the same for productivity. Um, and and then the, the 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 true added value comes when you start building this profile of an end user. You know that Roger loves Mexican food, uh, and uh, well, you, you don't expect uh, if Roger is hungry driving. What car are you driving? A uh, nice BMW. Lucky you. Uh, so. You say you're hungry. Well, we should know that you love Mexican food when you are, and, and we're going to make recommendations for you, which are Mexican restaurants. We don't want you to, I'm looking for a Mexican restaurant uh, with a five-star rating from TripAdvisor. So that's really, and the way we do that is we, we try to record your preferences uh, with your consent. Uh, we load the, the user behavior on the infotainment system so that when you skip Madonna, we, we're not going to propose you to listen too much to Madonna. And we use the location of the vehicle. We use vehicle data to know what's going on inside that car. Obviously, date and time of the day. And also, we, we use uh, the content providers that we've aggregated, the, all your historical preferences from those content providers. And then our, the goal is obviously to make predictive recommendations, to build predictive uh, discovery, to predict where you're heading to. Um, and uh, and to make, this is, it sounds scary. Yes, you, you need to agree for that. And, and, and then, we, we make those answers available, but then the key is how, the, how you, you make the user experience into the car relevant. That means not annoying, not like uh, giving you 10 recommendations every minute and, and not intrusive. That's, that's, that's tricky. So that's, that's what we're focusing on. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Julia. Okay. Holger? So I, I suspect Holger will talk about his vision of deappification in the car. Yeah, okay. Well, okay. Yeah. I wanted to ask Julian, what is happening if cloud car is disconnected? Well, we, 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 we call Max and he's fixing that. So. <laughs> <laughs> that is something we're talking all the day about the connected car. And we still have a situation where a car is barely in a, in a connectivity or in a strong connectivity constantly. So. Good. So I'm Holger Weiss. Um, CEO and founder of uh, German Auto Labs. 
And um, if uh, this goes well here, oh, give me a second. Good, very good. Thank you. I wanted to talk a little bit about what uh, Roger initially said. We uh, we see two elements of AI, or let's say two general elements here. One is more outside focusing, and that is something that um, you like that better. Good, uh, outside focusing, um, and that is what uh, what we heard uh, in the in the. In the uh, speeches be before mainly it's about autonomous driving lidar radar etc understanding is this uh, a cat or a bicycle or a shade of a tree or something like that and i wanted to talk a little bit about more what's happening inside the car and we also could describe this um, a little bit by those uh, terms that we all love in uh, in the industry there's this case term right this uh, connectivity autonomous sharing and electrification that is where a lot of um, uh, development and, uh, and uh, evolution is happening right now. But um, there's also um, something fundamentally different, uh, a change that uh, is happening in, in the automotive environment um, in, uh, inside the car in the HMI, the, the human machine interface. So what I like to do if I try to understand how far um, uh, the future will bring us, I like to look over to Hollywood. Hollywood is actually um, a, a better indicator, as you can imagine, for predicting technology. Um, there is a methodology that was developed in Hollywood over since the 50s by the scriptwriter guild to predict a technology in a, in a meaningful and a, in a sensible manner. And we know that uh, Starship Enterprise, a lot of the uh, 60, 70 series technology we find in our reality, right? The communicator, we call it uh, the smartphone these days, etc., cetera, um, and, uh, and others as well. So uh, what, what this guy actually is doing, he's flying a very autonomous thing, his ship, right? And the interface that he's using to communicate with the ship is his voice. He's just talking to a ship and say, hey, computer, where's uh, Lieutenant Uhura? Or um, if uh, if we look to this other movie here, her, uh, very beautiful, four years ago, um, it's playing in the in the far future. You do not know exactly this a little bit shy gentleman here, uh, who's uh, in in his life uh, a love letter writer, author, uh, falls in love uh, with the uh, operating system of his computer because this is so natural, talking to him and feeling like him, etc. The voice is by Scarlett Johansson. Maybe that is one of the reasons why that is happening. But she's omnipresent. He has a little button in his ear, etc. So, but when we're talking about our industry, all of that was foreseen, as we know, of course, in the 80s, right? Michael Knight, the Knight Rider, um, uh, buddy, I need a uh, kid, I need you, buddy, um, like that, right? turning the car into a companion, into someone who understands me, who knows how I'm feeling, and especially who's talking to me and uh, proactively uh, taking care of me. So that is something that uh, we see rising at the moment. We spoke a little bit about uh, this before here. Uh, recently, with this, I would say, the, the second race, uh, rise of uh, voice assistance. So uh, voice inter, uh, um, assistance, or let's say voice interfaces, are not a new thing. I mean, we all have these uh, uh, experience with um, in-car navigation systems with uh, that were voice-enabled, right? It's uh, quite a frustrating type of experience. Um, the, um, the reason for that was that in the first 40 years of, uh, of that technology, um, the, the level of understanding, right, the level how much the machine understood of what you said to it was at about 60, 65 percent at the end. And, uh, and that is, uh, some people say that's uh, the average in a, uh, in a, in a good, uh, uh, with a good couple. And that is why you stop talking to each other, because you just don't understand. That's why we stopped using those navigation systems. But over the past five, six years, we got a breakthrough here. We are now at 97 percent. That has a lot to do with cloud computing with AI, also with these gentlemen over there, with the, with the infrastructures like AWS allowing us that. So meaning that computers understand today on the human level, which is um, something that uh, that we all feel when we when we start to uh, use and, and started to use those systems like Siri and, um, and Alexa uh, and so on. Um, and, and this is the technical reason. But there's also another reason that uh, technologies need this tipping point. Um, uh, that uh, that enable them to really being used and, uh, and 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 adopted, and that's something that we also feel that there is a whole generation growing up now who just will talk to 
all things, right? I mean, there will be uh, a very new uh, interface. So now when we're thinking about where this is going to happen, um, for a long time, um, it was uh, uh, very clear it's going to happen in the connected home. So we want to say, hey, Alexa, switch on the lights, or Siri, uh, do I have uh, milk left in the fridge, or whatever we want to, to say, or open the garage door, something like that. So recently, all of these uh, hypotheses were a little bit uh, uh, cooled uh, uh, down uh, by the understanding that it's still easier to just stand up and switch on the lights or taking the remote control, etc. So while, and that is not a surprise, in a car, it makes way more sense. Because, I mean, we heard here, not only in your presentation, that for a very long time, uh, we still will have people steering cars, uh, cars and while you steer a car, um, you uh, should focus on the road and having the hands on the on the wheel and the eyes on the road and not on your mobile phone, for example, and uh, replying to your Facebook messages or watching your YouTube videos. Uh, but even in autonomous driving environment, and that was the example with, uh, uh, with uh, Jean-Luc Picard from the USS Enterprise, um, the interface will turn uh, into the car. So what, um, what we believe in, in, in Drum Auto Labs and what we are working at, those trends will be dominated by very strong platforms, horizontal platforms. The Alexas of this world and Cortana and Siri and Bixby and Alibaba and, and so on. So there will be a handful. Um, and, and they will control a lot of our daily lives just by the fact, and that was what uh, Roger said, that uh, with having an assistant, there will something happening in all of your lives there will be a de-appification. So because you don't use any more apps and, and, and services as you do at the moment, you just say, hey, Alexa, I have to fly tomorrow to Geneva. I don't want to arrive after 10. Uh, book me a hotel not more than 10 minutes away or 10 kilometers away, and in the morning I need a shuttle. So you would not really care about where this assistant actually would, uh, would doing that. So. And that is a, is a, is a fantastic, uh, uh, that's a fantastic uh, thing for, uh, uh, for Amazon. And, and for you as a user, uh, because uh, they control and you get the service, it's not so much a fantastic thing for uh, the service provider who's somehow uh, uh, outside of that gate. So if we now transfer this um, into the real life, then we see these horizontal platforms, right? But what would it mean in a, in a car? In a car, it would mean that actually uh, there would be one interface, and this one interface would not be controlled by the OEM, uh, but by someone else, uh, by an out, uh, uh, outside company. Um, there is a lot of data, user data, that will uh, be involved into that. So long story short, we believe why these horizontal players will dominate uh, that, uh, that voice uh, assistant game, there will be uh, there will be a need, a very strong need for vertical players. Vertical players meaning the, in our case, the digital co-driver, making a digital assistant, a digital co-driver. And uh, the question is, what could this be? And it's it's very clear. So I, I came back from Las Vegas uh, CS and Alexa, meanwhile, is able to flush toilets, right? Um, which is probably in one or the other case a, a, a helpful thing. But I don't know if you really want to have someone flushing your toilet driving your car or being your co-driver in a sense that taking care of you, uh, uh, keeping you safe, understanding what's behind the curve, etc. So what we're doing here is really focusing on what is the DNA, what's the nature uh, that turns a voice assistant into a co-driver other than a home assistant or a, a co-worker, etc. Those are things like acting proactive. You don't want to ask, for example, a co-driver in rally sport after the curve what you should have known before the curves. That's something that uh, is, uh, is one example. So um, to sum this up, we're building a, a, a platform, uh, a vertical platform for voice AI in the car that is uh, providing, I like to say, the soul and the brain of this assistant, optimizing uh, for, uh, for in-car usage. And interacting uh, with those horizontal platforms. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, last but not least, Tommaso Grassi from TomTom. Tom. And thank you for mentioning safety, Holger. <laughs> thank you, my name is uh, Tommaso Grassi. I'm uh, uh, responsible for business development uh, Europe for TomTom Tom, uh, Autonomous Driving. Uh, so one of the questions that uh, microphone. 
one of the questions that this panel's aim, aim to address is also uh, where are we in the transition from driver assistance to full autonomy or for full autonomous driving? Um, and well, I just wanted to kind of uh, zoom in on some of the technology improvements that need to happen before we can actually uh, yeah, say that we achieved full autonomy. So if you essentially dissect a self-driving car today, uh, these are the key components that uh, essentially comprise a self-driving car. So it's, it's composed of maps, it's composed of sensors, uh, driving policy, which is essentially uh, the software that will um, essentially tell the vehicle how to drive in a safe uh, manner and, and obey, obey the, tra the traffic rules, um, and actuators as well. So where are we today in uh, in the spectrum from you know manual driving to full, full complete autonomy and the professor will forgive me if i use the different levels of automation uh before this purpose i think it's... <laughs> so if we look at the different levels as uh, you know determined by the sae we are essentially somewhere here so between level two and level three and and uh, we're at the stage where um it's it's a big transition because going from level two to level three essentially means from a safety perspective uh, that you go from saying the driver always needs to pay attention to the vehicle is on its own or at least in certain situations the vehicle has to be on its own um, and so today uh, most of the automated vehicles or vehicles that have driver assistance systems are equipped with mostly sensors uh, but how do you actually make the jump from level two to level three and even level four and five well to kind of uh, explain in simple terms, well, OEMs are starting to introduce uh, maps. So digital maps uh, to be used in the automated driving systems. Uh, and these maps, of course, will be used also for level three, four, and five. But so why are uh, OEMs essentially throwing maps into this kind of, uh, into the into the pot? Well, for kind of the uses are twofold. So the first one is, if you already have a, uh, a level two system, for example, uh, you can use maps to improve the system or uh, add extra functionalities or expand the function that you have. Um, and the second use is essentially just taking the function to the next level. So from going to level two to going to level three. And why are these maps needed? So how do these maps help uh, the system essentially? Uh, and how do the maps help the car drive itself? Well, uh, for starters, they work in all conditions, all weather conditions. They're not affected like, for example, sensors by uh, different lighting conditions or, or rain, for example. Um, so they're kind of a what we call a good weather sensor. Um, well, they help anticipate the road ahead. So sensors typically have a range of a couple of hundred meters. So that means your car can only see couple hundred meters ahead. Um, using a map, well, you can already predict what the road ahead looks like. And finally, well, they reduce the, con the, the computing power needs of the vehicle. Because um, if you drive without a map, it's the same as driving essentially a, for a human, it's the same as driving in a road that is completely new to you. So imagine driving on a road that you've never driven before. Um, you're more likely to pay attention to everything that is going on on the road. Uh, now, Think about actually driving your commute, so from home to work. Well, that's a road that you've probably done hundreds of times, so you don't really pay attention to the road. Um, you're a bit less, you're a bit more on autopilot, let's say. Um, and this is kind of the equivalent of driving with a map or without a map. So without a map, the sensors, so the vehicle always needs to understand everything that's going on as if it discovered it for the first time. With a map, it's as if you, you had a kind of like a memory of the of the road. And so what? Are we uh, at TomTom Tom doing about this? So we've uh, we've essentially our heritage is in navigation systems. Uh, we are a leading uh, provider of navigation systems to the automotive market. Uh, but now our focus is on helping OEMs bring automated vehicles to life, and we do this by building uh, maps for automated vehicles that are tailored to different levels of automation. So of course you're not going to use the same type of map for level one or two or four or five. Um, well, we're building maps that are highly accurate. So we're talking about uh, decimeter level accuracy, um, highly attributed. So these maps include, uh, as you can see behind me, all sorts of attributes such as lane markings, uh, traffic signs, um, lane edges, and lane geometry. Uh, and they're light and optimized for in-vehicle usage so that most of the processing actually happens in, in the cloud. And well, so our goal essentially is to build uh, maps uh, to essentially facilitate uh, OEMs into bringing automation to the next level. Uh, we believe that maps are the key to unlock next levels of automation. And our goal is to uh, provide maps and work together with, uh, with OEMs uh, to build maps that help them bring autonomous driving to market um, safely, 
quickly and at scale. Thank you. Okay. So I think the common thread we're talking about here is a little bit antithetical to the last panel discussion, which was all about cybersecurity and uh, uh, protecting information. Uh, all of these solutions want to gather uh, data from vehicle sensors, uh, whether those sensors are uh, facing the driver in the vehicle. And I think it's worth noting that uh, Euro NCAP is uh, laying the groundwork for driver monitoring as sort of the next layer of uh, to, to get the five-star rating, um, as well as gathering data from around the vehicle to enable uh, autonomous operation. Um, the, the strange thing is that if we are truly successful in, in this pursuit, um, we will have fully connected fleets operating autonomously with a lot fewer vehicles uh, on the road serving uh, populations as opposed to trying to give a car to everybody. But um, uh, it would, I, I'm, I'd like to get the panelists to talk a little bit about how this, is, these, this technology is changing the industry uh, and how we're coming to grips with it. And um, uh, I, I think we want to emphasize, you know, the positive uh, aspects, uh, but there, there may be some negative, but, um, and, and we can start at, at the end and, and then and work our way over, but anybody can jump in. Oh, super, is this, yeah, it's working. Um, I think we, we discussed it yesterday, Roger, I think that there's something like um, 100 billion that has been invested in the autonomous vehicle market for technology that will be used for autonomous vehicles. What, what I'm really interested in is how that technology actually gets used, gets deployed, but actually comes down to ADAS and then goes all the way down to the lower middle income countries where actually the most road deaths are occurring. And I, I think that's something that we'll start to see is the pressure on actually deploying that technology for, for good effectively, not just for the sort of commercial revenues focused around cities, focused around mobility as a service. So I think that's something that we're, uh, we're going to see. Um, we spoke yesterday about uh, performance being part of that or safety, vehicle control being part of that. That's where we see motorsport well, that, playing that a key perspective role. perspective is near and dear to Alan, and, and, and uh, I have a, an issue with cars. I mean, I just don't think cars should run into things, right? That just doesn't make sense. It's a basic consumer product. Uh, it shouldn't, you know, let me change a lane uh, into another car that's in the other lane that I happen not to see. Um, but that requires an car. Uh, is the only solution uh, a mandate? What What is your thinking? Do we have to require these well, uh, think, capabilities? Uh, well, no, I I don't. Uh, man, sure. If we're trying to mandate, go ahead. Um, uh, but we're not. I I think I, I said it when 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 the insurance industry realizes that the cost of, of the technology to keep you from doing that it just sits there, just like our our analog brakes. Don't let us apply the brakes in the wrong way. They say, you know, don't push the pedal to the floor. Ease up. It's Do well, that, and as soon as that as soon as that happens, as soon as as that leads to a, a lower expected liability exposure to the entity, then there's money on the table from insurance to pay for that and make money. And so there's going to be an insurance. Uh, uh, entity in there that's going to uh, disrupt but by, it by the way to your, to your point about cars uh, being able to go too fast what was the word from volvo here okay so they're writing off the they're just writing off the german market Sure, I let my speedometer show 180. I mean, what the, I wouldn't know the difference. I mean, but, you know, it's if, if it's dealing with perception and dealing with my perception. Okay. The is, is the actual make sure, make sure you speak into the microphone, by the way. Okay. 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 By the way. Sure. By the way, Philippe, you have a, an insurance company or a reinsurance company investing in what you're doing. What What are their thoughts about this? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, also, I, I don't know the full extent of their thoughts, but... Well, okay, it, I'll it, ask more generally. Is the insurance industry our friend? Well, I, I have some opinions on that subject. Is this working? Yeah. So, um, no, but I think we actually yeah, have a, a, cu a couple of large insurance players, um, and it shows the interest in, in, in what's really happening, right? For, for me, there was a wave, the wave of the web, the wave of mobile, and now the wave of mobility, solving two world problems, which is 
know, the environment, the pollution with electric, and, and the, the, the congestion, which is we spend mindless hours in our car just waiting for the next car to move forward. Uh, and I think that the, the, everybody knows that those are the huge problems that we're solving with, with mobility. And um, the, 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 all the, the traditional companies, including the insurance companies, uh, have, a, you know, the early movers have a lot to gain. They see it as an opportunity. And, and, uh, and the late movers have, have a lot to lose because, you know, the, the world is going to move forward. An autonomous car is going to be much lower risk and, you know, potentially a lot less uh, auto insurance revenue. Right, so you can you can imagine if there's 80% less risk of an accident, there's 80% less, uh, you know, c car insurance uh, revenue, um, and that's a huge uh, fright frightening thing. At the same time, they recognize that all these models need to evolve, and the first thing everybody needs is data. So the reason we also have an autonomous d division is sort of open data sharing because we realize that I, I said legal and uh, cities and 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 and, and insurance companies are going to be with sort of public perception, maybe the three main blockers of moving to autonomous quickly, right? And, and the insurance model will be, well, sure, I'll insure your autonomous car and, and, and put a very high price sticker on it, right? That's a, that's a, that's a way of putting a break on the industry. And, and what, so what they're doing is basically saying, you know, by working with us, they actually get access to the data quicker and they can make the new models um, of, um, of determining the real risk. And, 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 and basically be the first to offer, you know, smart insurance uh, solutions. Well, well, and you're operating vehicles in a couple of different operating environments, business models and scenarios. So car sharing, ride hailing, and sort of uh, geofenced areas. Yeah, yeah. Places. Well, yeah. So, so, yeah, we look at it from the three l large angles of fleet management, which is uh, car sharing, ride sharing, and fleet management. So we, we basically have, you know, many different use cases and large fleets, uh, you know, uh, it represents uh, thousands of cars that basically, um, you know, pr pr can provide all that data of the future that, uh, you know, the insurance companies will need, but also, you know, the city regulators, as, as I mentioned. I think that that's another key factor. Are you treated any uh, better as, a, a, as an insurance customer since you're connected to your vehicles and you're collecting that data and you're, you're operating a business so you can do the analytics and make a case for wanting and deserving a better rate? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's always like a business discussion. So I think that, uh, you know, ho hopefully with, with uh, you know, insurance investors as our partners, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find the solutions early. But, uh, you know, I, I think that right now, what we're trying to solve is really build the new mobility use cases. And I, and I, and I think that that's what, what they see in us. And, that, and what we see in them. Just so yeah. you know where I'm coming from, I always get aggravated with the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety because they always do these studies that show that either the consumers are turning off the uh, 8S features or that the efficacy of that feature is not reducing claims and therefore the insurance company should not give a discount for automatic emergency braking or blind spot detection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're slowly coming around now, but for years it was, no, our studies show it doesn't reduce claims, therefore you shouldn't get a discount. But but that's because it didn't work. You know, the automated emergency braking systems don't work. Don't okay? or didn't? They don't work, okay? Because, because, because the object ahead is stationary and we assume we can pass underneath it and we can't determine well enough whether or not we can pass underneath it. So the, the error rate associated with that is such that uh, it's going to start putting the brakes on and therefore if it puts the brakes on and, and it didn't have to put the brakes on, I take it back and it's a lemon. And so, of course, turn it off. All right. And so until we can get this stuff to work well enough so that, in fact, the probability that, in, that it can determine whether or not we can pass under a, 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 a truck that's ahead of us or we can't, which is what happened 10 days ago. Boom. Another another Joshua Brown. Why? Because the automated emergency braking system doesn't work on a Tesla. They turn it off for stationary objects. Well, don't Not only hold them. the Tesla example up as a... Yeah, <laughs> it's 80% it's of the OEM which are not considering stationary obstacles are as real obstacles. It's only when the thing is moving that they adapt to the cruise and the speed. Ah, okay, well. So this is why a lot of these accidents happen. It's because you're on a highway, you have one vehicle going on the right lane, and the vehicle ahead what is stationary. The vehicle do not consider this as an obstacle and just, just don't brake at all. 
but I mean, that is uh, maybe a good, uh, if, if I may, um, by all means, <laughs> jump in here. So we're talking about um, AI and the status of AI in, in, uh, in, in, in automotive. And we just heard there are a hundred billion dollars invested into autonomous driving technologies. And I would say there are about 80 startups in Silicon Valley going bust very soon because uh, the, the hype will be over very soon. So, but it's exactly that. All that will not work without the data. So one mentioned that here before and, 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 and you buying a company to, to uh, get that data and to learn about that. Um, and, and there will be fatalities and, and casualties, um, with, with, like in the case of Tesla, there are people dying, right? And uh, I mean, mankind could say, okay, you have to, to do that to uh, not having people dying in the future. Um, but that is something where we also shouldn't be naive with everything what we're seeing at the moment. We are not in the fifth dimension type of thing with robot taxis and autonomous driving car. 98% of what we're seeing has nothing to do with AI. It's machine learning. Machine learning needs to be trained on a very low level. And, uh, and that's something uh, where I think at the moment we are completely, as an industry, exaggerating about the capabilities that we have. I would say for the next 15, 20 years, people will to almost 100% still steering cars and not driving autonomous, at least, as, at least not uh, in, on, a, on a mass market type of uh, uh, scale. And yet, right, so, and if I, if I could just throw in on that, we may be at, at peak uh, deep learning in AI. In other words, we've had a big hype since two, 2012 of all the, hey, I can tell it's the difference between a dog and a cat. But these adversarial attacks, the adversarial piece, the, the fact that this is a black box by which I can change one pixel on a recognition of numeral zero to, to nine and have that just by changing the intensity of one pixel, have it flip from probability essentially one would be a five to probability one, uh, better that it's a nine all of a sudden flip by one pixel, you can't tell the difference. We don't know what's going on inside of that deep learning neural network. It has gazillion uh, 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 coefficients in there, nonlinear functions, it's probably overfitting, and, and darn it, uh, it may not be robust, and we may, be, we may have to go through a dark period again until the next breakthrough is made. So. But, say, keep, keep your horses. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I hope we're not giving up because, as a matter of fact, of course, Ride Cell and Invest Mile are operating today, correct? Yes, we are, but um, I fully agree with the fact that we don't use AI. And just a small, a small anecdote um, one of our investors, one a potential investor, told us at, I don't remember exactly the context, but he told us. You don't use the word AI, and this is why we are here today, because there are so much hype around this, and it's just a buzzword that a lot of companies, and especially startups, are using. But behind there is nothing. It's just a bit of machine learning and a lot of PowerPoints, but this is not the reality. So yes, I think um, we have companies like, like RightSell and us focusing on trying to get these vehicles uh, on the road today to learn, to get the data, but also to learn like for an operator, what does it mean operationally to have to manage autonomous vehicles? And this is a long learning curve also because it brings a lot of new constraints and a lot of new challenges that they need to face. And we are starting like with uh, these types of shuttles that we have here in Europe. Um, I think we, we need to consider things that um, the start of these autonomous vehicles in the US and in Europe, we took two different ways. Um, in the US, the, 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 the thing was like this, we want to try to reach level five, so let's start with level zero or one and let's try to go up the curve until level five. Um, and some, some companies in Europe said, you want uh, something that is like a level five, just remove the steering wheel and the pedals and see what we can do with this. And this is what happened. And at one point, these two strategies are supposed to, to, to arrive to the same point and we will learn different things. Um, I think that today in the US, okay, Waymo did millions of miles with their autonomous vehicles, but who ever tested once 
at CS, perhaps. <laughs> but <laughs> besides CS, did you ever went into an autonomous, one of these autonomous vehicles uh, from these big companies? No, but you can go here in Sion, in Switzerland, and test two autonomous shuttles running in a city center. Okay, it's very low speed. It's just a technical demonstration of what the vehicles are able to do because doing a loop in a small city center, you don't have a lot of transportation meaning behind, but you can still go and, and see how, how people react to this. So yes, I think we should start somewhere and, and um, just to learn because learning is, is just key. But to get to, to my point, and uh, I, I have a feeling you have something to say about this as well. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> because we're not just trying to up understand the envir operating environment of the vehicle, we're also trying to understand the state of the driver and the uh, intentions of the driver, you know, from their voice and, and gestures and things. I mean, cameras are coming into the car. Uh, so it, it's a broad scope of uh, changing this relationship with the human, the lump of meat behind the steering wheel, if there's going to be a steering wheel. But what are your thoughts? No, I, I mean, can you hear me? I, yeah. Um, I think we are pushing a little bit too hard on a, on a complex pro problem, trying to solve it tomorrow. Um, if, if, I, if I look back at, uh, I would say, let, let's say broader Amazon culture, it's, it's very much about thinking big but starting small and then scaling fast because the technology allows it. Um, so I, I think we all agree that in 10, 15, 25, whatever it's the number, autonomous driving will be there. Um, so I, I don't think that we can say it's tomorrow. No one probably really knows when, uh, but there are many, many examples where some pieces of technologies, like it's a big puzzle, right? So are going in the right place. So if I, if I look at, uh, let's say Holger, trying to solve a piece of that um, and, and, and looking, you know, also at this connected car, what we can do today or ride the cell, best mile or, or Tom Tom. I, I mean, the, the idea of uh, solving in one day a problem, it's, it's impossible. But I would like to, to reverse a little bit. We have, uh, you know, customers out there that are looking for solutions um, and and technology in this moment it's it's not an issue right you can uh, um, you can easily analyze petabyte of data in hours you well, can your, easily your tensorflow is your service right uh, no we we support it yeah, you uh, simple it's mxnet we support all main cafe and, and all main stuff. The, uh, but, but again, the technology is there. I, I think Roborace is showing, I mean, the, the, um, the, the technology can help. I think we are a little bit forgetting the human side. Uh, legislation, liability, as it was mentioned. I saw uh, a nice video from Volvo testing and uh, recording the reaction of drivers when the car is taking over and driving. Um, so I, I would say that... Uh, well, it depends on whether you saw the first reaction or the third or fourth reaction. Yeah, I mean... The first the, one is... Yeah, I think we were together in... in, in, in and and the subsequent are like, it's okay. Yeah, and, and but, but, but this is something we need to work on. So I would really encourage to start from the customer and working backward for there, not really thinking about, oh, there's a technology or not. Well, let me ask you in the panel, because Anne brought up a, a, a key point, and it's embodied in GM. So GM has Super Cruise, and I, I'm fond of saying it's the um, roadhouse blues of, uh, of uh, level two driving. Uh, the doors, keep your eyes on the road and your hands upon the wheel. Well, if you're keeping your eyes on the road in a Super Cruise vehicle, you can take your hands off the wheel. Okay, well, anyway. I don't know how many Jim Morrison fans are here, but uh, anyway, uh, meanwhile, they own cruise automation, which is trying to make that great leap directly to automated driving. And I think it's becoming a little more difficult than they originally anticipated. It is a little bit more difficult, but my question is, do we want to have this intermediary step where we don't know exactly who is in charge of the vehicle, the human or the technology? And this is where we have situations like the one with Teslas. I think this is the most dangerous thing to do, is to say the vehicle can help you, but you are still responsible. And this is what the insurance will say. In any case, you should have taken it back. So I don't know. I kind of feel that this mixed 
situation where the vehicle and the human have to take co-decisions, it's dangerous. Level three, not, not a big fan. <laughs> yeah. if, if I may there. well, And it, I'm it, Swiss neutral, but uh, level three. <laughs> well, so I understand, I understand the point in the sense of uh, the uncertainty of who's in charge and who's operating the vehicle, actually. And I think also the OEMs are not making it easier in terms of their marketing, for example. And there's a bit of over-promising over going on there. But at the same time... Uh, the, <laughs> leaving names out but um yeah so in the in the, the business model will not work if you just wait to commercialize until you have a level five or level four and so oems need to one start developing the technology today and hope that it works and but i think the the root cause of the problem is there is that um, the same approach for autonomous driving is being, they have taken the same approach for autonomous driving as they have taken for any other development in the vehicle for the past 20 years. And the, the problem with autonomous driving is that we all, we're all good at knowing, okay, the cars will all drive themselves, they will not have steering wheels, there will be pods and they will come pick you up. Sure, everybody has the end goal in mind, but very few know how to actually figure it out. And so the industry nowadays is kind of in, uh, okay, let's uh, shut up and get to work uh, kind of mode. And you don't see many huge announcements anymore, as you well, were. Well, let's not forget ago. that when they finally are successful, I don't think this is an owned vehicle, which is the ultimate irony to me. But anyway, um, I, 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 I don't know what you're going to say, but my, my thought is, uh, uh, you know, it, there, it sort of raises quite, why are we doing this in the first place? It's because the path to getting to here hopefully will introduce, you know, safer driving circumstances, you know, uh, on the yeah, along track. the way. Uh, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I was, I was just picking up on that point about um, human and AI and whether they can work together as a pair or not. And that, uh, that's, that's something that's fundamental across all of our lives in every area. And if we really believe that it's either humans on their own or AI on its own, I think we're in a bit of a, a difficult situation. We definitely have to look at that intersection and where humans and machines can actually work together. So we have two vehicles. We have the Robocar outside, that's fully autonomous, you know, showing the AI can do this on its own. We can put that in extreme environments that we can't put humans in. So we can race those cars in a full traffic environment with 60 mile an hour trucks while the car's doing 200 miles an hour. So we can push the technology limits beyond where we're all comfortable driving just to show that the technology can do that. Well, you to you build proposed trucks. an interesting concept yesterday, which was uh, that, that, that the AI infused car could actually train a human how to drive and, and that's that's why we have the second vehicle but the irony being of course that the humans presumably are teaching the computers how to drive in the first at, place at the moment yeah that's what's interesting so if you have a car that's fully autonomous capable then when the human's driving what do we want that system to be doing do we want to turn it off do we want to turn off this 360 degree awareness because it's oh no the human's on their own now sorry we're not going to help you i don't think that's that's sensible to anybody so what we're starting to look at is how can humans and machines work together as a pair. And if you look at Toyota's positioning really as guardian, guardian angel, it's starting the other way around. It is starting from this is what humans can do really well. This is where they make mistakes. And this is how we can use AI to prevent them making the mistakes. That's a much simpler use case. It's much more deployable now and it will save lives immediately. And another another piece of uh, AI, uh, at least uh, an application of Alexa, which it doesn't always have to be described as AI necessarily, uh, but I see voice technology being added to ADAS systems to tell the driver what is going on in the car, which is an interesting idea. I, so the, the best example that we have is, uh, I, I tend to say, when I was 17, I was learning to drive. I wasn't allowed out on a car on my own. I had to have a, a, a trained driver that sat next to me, either a parent that was driving or an instructor. And what's that instructor there to do? Perceive the environment, perceive the risks, advise me on what to be looking for within that environment. So why, when I pass my test, am I considered to be expert enough not to need that person anymore? Especially when I've not driven in every type of operational design domain, as the industry would say. So I can pass my test in the UK, I've never driven on a motorway. Can we imagine autonomous vehicles being approved if they haven't ever driven in that domain? You have a question? No, no question. If, we, if we look at the, the uh, accident statistics, they absolutely confirm exactly what you're saying. Most accidents occur um, with new drivers between the ages of 18 to 24, and then, then 
bumps up to 27 or so, and then it levels off as people get more experience. Yep. Um, we now have have vehicles are, that are out there. You, you've used the, ter the term artificial intelligence. I'm not really sure that any vehicles that are operating today, including yours, is actually using artificial intelligence. I like to use the term that the, that the economist prefers, which is collective intelligence, because the intelligence that's put, in, put into robots, whether it's a car or any other type of, is our intelligence. We've put that information at the disposal of this, this robot. But that, that's another question. Just <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree. I'm, I'm, I've, I've heard it takes about two years for a, a human to then build up uh, a, a, a safe level of driving to have, have seen it enough. But for that two years, they are on their own. And, and you know that is the incredibly unsafe part. I'd have to but, imagine. I mean, it's fair to say that there were 300,000 years of evolution before, right? I mean, it's and, and then we started learning driving, and then two years is not too long, I think. I mean, of course, and, but just to add what you said before, I mean, um, I think no one is uh, is uh, is questioning that in general that this technically it's possible and and I always like to say the technology we have it's it's usually not a problem of technology and beautifully uh, demonstrated here and and, and the robo car uh, I saw the um, Nvidia is also running one right in in Munich it's it's phenomenal and and people are really like wow and and, and giving applause but if you um, do a robo car 200 miles per hour versus a truck 60 miles per hour type of test you wouldn't do this in the city center of Geneva on a Monday morning at eight o'clock no. so and, and I think that is something where we see at the moment that um, I said that to a certain extent uh, we uh, we are al already beyond the boundaries that are responsible in, in understanding that this needs time. And that comes very much from the perception that software can solve everything uh, just by this uh, beta type of iterative. We test, we, we fail, we test, we fail, we test, we fail. And, and it's, it's simply something very different doing this in a car or with a, with a whatever uh, a Pokemon Go type of game, right? Where you might gonna stumble upon a tree and say, oh, we didn't see this because the AR was not uh, so clear. And just to go back to what Anna was saying before, yes, there's a lot of hype around AI and a lot of what we are doing and what the industry is doing is actually collecting the data and training the system and and, and one of the challenges that we collectively face right now is that there are some companies who are better positioned to collect that data. And they are the big ones with a B2C offering who can definitely address such a huge amount of, of people. While, I mean, you're doing a good job rolling out your, your, your product right now. We, we've got Jaguar Land Rover vehicles and, and end user interacting with our technology. But that's nothing compared to the yeah the the million of end users talking to Google, Apple, Alexa. Um, yeah, that's that's a big challenge for us. Yeah. Well, besides all the besides all the testing uh, that we're doing, there's also the simulation, and in fact, the simulations have gotten to be a, an awful lot better. And so, the, it's really not the number of miles that you end up driving. It's it's those. Uh, particular use cases you know it's it's really 150 feet or something like that or 150 meters uh, uh, in that critical time when things happen that you can then test with simulation so we're, we're making a lot of progress with that and then of course we have amazon sitting here okay <laughs> amazon okay uh, uh, amazon what does amazon need most free shipping uh, guess when they might be able to do free shipping uh, between uh, 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. when there's nobody out there and deliver all this stuff to my house. So, well, I know you haven't told us what Amazon is doing in driverless uh, mobility and so on. If if we want to see who's going to be first out there and who has the real business case to be first out there, uh, Amazon. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, am, I, have, I have a quick uh, a yes or no, or sorry, hands up, hands uh, not up question. Um, everybody here, for with autonomous vehicles, they're they're on the road or semi-autonomous. So it's not that would be safer to say semi-autonomous cars with level two kind of automation. Do we want to see more? So put a hand up if you want to see more regulation as opposed to less regulation. So more or less? Okay. That's the more. That looks like. 
Yeah, okay, I'll give it to more. All right. Any any questions from the audience for the panel on, on this subject? Shall we just continue? <laughs> Come on, audience. Sure. Because we just were talking about cybersecurity. Now we're talking about autonomous driving. Yeah, it's the shared mobility. Um, I've always had a personal question about how it works in low density rural areas and the business model Actually, for it. Uh, the surprising thing is, um, we've, uh, with my students, we just ran through uh, several iterations of the billion or so <clears throat> individual trips that we think occur in the United States on a typical day. And in fact, even in North Dakota, uh, the ride sharing opportunities do exist there such that uh, you could get a, uh, basically a, I think it's a 67% uh, reduction in vehicle miles traveled if you did sharing using robo taxis or what I call autonomous taxis. What happens in low, what surprisingly happens in low density areas is it's low density, but guess what? There are a few places to go. So therefore, in fact, the key thing with respect to ride sharing is the probability that you're coming from about the same place to about the same place uh, at about the same time. And guess what? A lot of it, you know, kids go to school. Maybe you want to shove them into a, a school bus. You should hate to do that. Uh, my goodness, uh, they spend how many hours out there wasting their lives? Uh, they could be doing it in much smaller vehicles. So there, it turns out the opportunity, it, it's surprising as hell. We, we didn't expect it. Yeah, no, 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 I agree with that. That We also thought that uh, sort of the mobility as a service was not applicable to outside the, the major urban areas. And there are actually a lot of use cases. But I think that if you look at a, the, the large car sharing programs today, they're focused on urban areas, obviously, because that's where the biggest or lowest hanging fruit is. Uh, that's where, you know, the the, the, the biggest problem of, uh, of pollution exists. Uh, that's where, you know, you, you can have the biggest bang for the buck if you want on on uh, running these new programs. You certainly shouldn't disqualify running uh, robo taxis in, in North Dakota, I heard, because it, that that actually, uh, there are use cases that, that it can work. But that's not going to be the priority investment of fleets, for instance. Right, because it's going to be much more uh, uh, difficult from a from a complexity perspective. On services, isn't it? Is yeah. What you have yeah. traditionally in, uh, in rural areas that you have on demand services, and that's something. I mean, I don't know how this is in the US, but uh, in Germany and Europe, that used to be a popular service that you could call uh, a, a mini bus, and then you waited a bit longer than for the regular bus, and, and picked you up, or you uh, so just that the public transport companies could not afford anymore with a with a on-demand semi-autonomous or fully autonomous driving um, you don't need a fleet to go there and pick someone up i mean it's one yeah, car. no i mean the, the kinds of ride sharing you want are the twosies threesies and that's not enough money to pay for a, for a bus driver but it certainly is enough money to pay for one of these uh, uh waymo vehicles and so on to do that the other surprising number that i found in the s1 of the lift filing is i think i, I don't remember exactly on my on top of my mind i think it's 46 percent of the lift rides were picked up or dropped off in low-income areas and which I, someone mentioned that before that um somebody did mention that before and going back to hollywood uh, going back to Hollywood, um, if you think about, I mean, not moving humans, but moving goods, parcels, um, Prime Air was born to serve rural areas where it makes no sense to drive. So um, if so you look you at you, air you bus, the packages there uh, with yeah. little parachutes? Yeah, oh, it's not cool. parachutes, it's a, 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 it's a drone. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, let's think also about flying humans because it will happen, maybe not around the corner. There are several tests around the world. Um, and, and, and again, if you go to parcels was, I mean, small drones, but think about also flying humans, um, it, it will happen. So don't limit yourself to think that everything moving will be on the ground. Any other questions? Oh, I have um, not a question, but okay. uh, maybe another provocative uh, comment on what you said before. Um, because um, there was, uh, I think you said that uh, right sharing is, uh, uh, has a, has a the, the good goal is to avoid and reduce congestion. 
and uh, and we talk a lot about what uh, could technically work and what is reality reality today and that's my impression i have no numbers for that is that everything that we like so much at the moment where we are so excited about the new mobility is doing anything else but reducing congestion Right. I mean, if you see the numbers of bikes lying around on Beijing's roads and uh, Berlin's roads, and um, uh, we have, I think, something like eight uh, car sharing companies now uh, in, in Berlin. Each of those, uh, this company has a minimum 500 to 800 cars. Otherwise, it doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, and there's still no car at the airport when I arrive at 10 o'clock in the night um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think um, also coming back to the point that I made before, it's great to test all that and and, and doing that and uh, i love to use all those uh, different uh, uh, those different uh, possibilities but at the moment it doesn't really really do any any better to to our environment or the congestion of the city well yeah so i i see a whole transportation environment that's tearing itself apart uh and uh, you know uber and lyft are tearing apart the taxi industry and uh car sharing the fact is that in manhattan there are now seven over 7,000 more cars ever since yeah, Uber yeah, started yeah. and not less. A absolutely. Because people still own cars, the taxis are there, and there are 7,000 more cars. But then Uber and Lyft are investing in bikes and scooters, which is taking away rides from the Uber and so, Lyft vehicles. So, sure. and then all these scooters lying around on... Um, what's so, all uh, of which are taking people uh, no, off no. of public transportation. No, no, but, so, uh, so, so, fully, fully, so just, to, just to react to that, because obviously, you know, that's it's taking a... Uh, a hit at, at sort of what I presented from a long-term perspective. I, I fully agree. In the, in the near term, it's like, I call it like the sort of investment curve or the pain curve. It's actually, you actually have higher congestion in the near term because it's the Wild West beginning, right? And, and you know, for it to actually go down, you're going to need to have sort of, you know, reduced complexity, uh, optimization, and, and, and just a, it's a similar, similar thing of San Francisco when you were talking about, my, you know, uh, micro mobility. When they opened up the, the scooters in San Francisco, there were 12 services that put on, you know, uh, kick scooters all over the city. And then San Francisco had to blow the whistle. And in the end, they only let two that were working, you know, on the, on the best solutions and closest to the cities and governments who ultimately made the call. So they had to clean up that whole Wild West scene. And all the big players, you know, uh, jump from Uber, Lyft, uh, Lime, Bird, Spin, all of those uh, did not uh, get permits. So that so so that's sort of like an organization call after the the the, the beginning, and there's m numerous examples of ride sharing in the early days, basically making that there's more cars roaming around in the city. They're not electric yet, so the environment, the pollution thing is uh, you know, moving to clean electricity. So that's a, that's another discussion, but uh, the congestion. Um, you, you need to be able to organize these fleets, and that that won't happen in overnight. I think so, it will be so more disorganized in the beginning. Coming right to you to say, oh well, yeah. go ahead. Uh, just one comment about um, this Uber, Lyft, and so on. I think they just have to move uh, a place into the ecosystem because their, their business model today, what they do peer-to-peer -peer, uh, um, marketplace, if autonomous one vehicle, auto autonomous vehicles would be there, it will disappear. And they have multiple choices. They are investing a lot in this um, micro-mobility into cities, but they are also moving more and more towards, for example, mass aggregators. Uh, Uber CEO is from Expedia. This is the same type of things in another industry. But I think the problem today in cities with this peer-to-peer -peer model, if you consider U Uber, for example, for each mile that they drive someone, they also drive an empty mile just because they are angling empty just to look for some riders. And this is one of the big problems of these uh, services is that today Uber, Lyft, Ola, Didi, they pay nothing to the drivers if the vehicles are empty. So their only problem is about recruiting as many drivers as possible so that when you open your application, you have some, someone in less than five minutes. I don't, they don't care so much about what this human guy is behind his uh, driving wheel. So this is also why we believe more in professional fleets, in, uh, in fleets where vehicles are owned by the operators, because it's only when you have a fixed number of assets that you can start optimizing. If you don't know how many vehicles are where or when, you can't really optimize anything. And you are just trying to assign the closest vehicle to the, to the, to the traveler because what they want is to have an immediate solution. Otherwise, they switch to another type of service.
So optimization is linked also to just knowing the status of, of your ecosystem. And this is where a change will happen. And who will own these vehicles? It may be OEMs. It may be other types of, of players, like, for example, rental car companies. They are the best position just to own and maintain okay. fleets. Well, my favorite uh, scenario in that regard is sponsored mobility. The shopping mall sends a vehicle to bring yeah. you to the mall. Someone will own the fleet. The question yeah. is who? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> but today, cities are just realizing that this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, types of services are creating more traffic than they were supposed to reduce the traffic. That they, they make they make made everything worse. So like before, ten percent so of, decre of decrease in the average speed in, in speed in New York in the ten last years. For sure, the city is growing, population is growing, but also all these systems are growing. So before we run out of time, and I, I may need Elaine uh, Alain's help on this one. Um, uh, we're getting more compute in the car, more storage, faster networks, more sensors. We're fusing the sensors uh, to create new uh, interpretations of the environment, presumably that will enable safer operation of the vehicle. But what I'm hearing from the panel is we don't have AI in the car today. Is that, is, are we, is that our conclusion of our AI panel, that we don't have AI in the car yet today? And if we don't, do we need it and when will we have it? <laughs> well, we we have some, and, and maybe I don't think that's the problem, or that's the, the that's the problem. We're we're going to have it. There are enough people that we that people talk about the amount of money that it's all going to be there. the The, the problem is, is going to be um, uh, I like to call it the welcoming environment uh, for all of this. It's it's this is going to need a welcoming environment, not only by the OEMs, not only by the mayors, not only by the governors, not only by the, but by the people on whose streets these things are going to drive down in front of. And I like to say, you know, if I don't want one of these things driving down my street, I'm going to either kid, I'm going to throw a brick through its window, or I'm going to run out from my front porch with a jack and jack it up and put a cinder block, put it on cinder blocks and steal the wheels. I mean, these are these are driverless vehicles going to pick up somebody, and if they're not welcomed in our neighborhood, if we don't believe that they are safe, there there's somebody here from the city government of Geneva I was talking to outside, and he and he said he he didn't you know he he's concerned about the safety. He's not going to let these vehicles run around at, and provide mobility to the mobility disadvantage here. So we've got to get get from all the techno jargon that we we all deal with every day to, to somebody's feeling good about these things saying the the reward is worth the risk and and actually you know making it happen believe so so yeah i just wanted to react because for, i mean for me like uh, i'm not nodding my head in on in approval when i'm hearing that there's no ai in the vehicle or even in, in our software for that matter uh, because I think uh, it, it's just a, a typical sort of AI backlash of, of buzzword because it's been used by every startup uh, that's born after 2016. And so, so everybody has sort of like a excessive, uh, you know, but AI is basically just to diffuse it. It's just, uh, you know, when there's micro decisions that can easier be made by a machine than by a human, why not let the machine do it? And then the AI part is when the machine self learns itself instead of having machine learning where the human trains the system. So it's not, it's just basically AI is sophisticated use of big data and cars are definitely repositories of big data, certainly the autonomous cars. Uh, even the, the software that's managing big data pools or data lakes, et cetera, is using- But yeah, for yeah. real uh, AI, uh, do we probably need a connection to the car maybe to, you know, to have more of a hybrid experience to do more sophisticated processing off board or self-contained in the vehicle, edge computing kind of? I well, I, I mean, um, I, I mean, pe people are working on both, right? And uh, and I think uh, for me, the answer uh, is also in the car because it's it's basically the the, the, the microchip that has to recognize in the, in, a, in a, a flick of a second. And also, you know, we talked about connectivity. What if it's you're not connected at that moment? You know, it would be good if the, you have the uh, the chips in the car to be able to say that that's a that's a, a dog or or that's just a, a football. Right and 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 that and that thing is is is, is super important and to have that quick reflex, a sort of a machine intelligence or uh, that that mimics the human brain. I think that that would be good if we can transpose it into car chips. Vehicles that you're meant to have some AI, yes. Yes. Um, 
from from uh, Roger, I, I think it's happening now. Um, if we think about AI, like I mean, a computer taking decisions, because uh, if you think automatic braking or lane assist is a computer taking a decision. So I think the the broader, I mean, when you think AI, like uh, Jean Luc Picard. We are not there yet, uh, but there are, there is uh, some brain in the, in the car, and I think you will see more and more hybrid models with edge and fog computing inside the vehicle. Um, I mean, the power of the cloud it's allowing you uh, to scale, to go fast, and to have this huge computational power. But then you have decisions that uh, should be in milliseconds inside the car. So usually you will see some something happening in the car, majority of heavy workloads in the cloud, and then what you deploy in, what you run in the cloud can be deployed back in the car with this continuous improvement. So uh, I think you will see, I mean, there is a German OEM doing that, uh, cleaning the data before moving them to the cloud using machine learning, which is a subset of AI uh, in the vehicle, and you will see more. I don't think that the totally 100% cloud vehicle will happen because you still need decision in milliseconds. And even if it's not about autonomous driving, I mean, I guess that's the same for, for Olga and uh, your, your co-driver assistant, and that's the same for us at Cloud Car. Uh, we, some of it needs to happen in the car when you don't have connectivity, and, and yes, it's much better when you can contact uh, this huge computing capability in the cloud. We have an edge yeah. <laughs> For, for me, it, it's fascinating from a from a uh, hello yeah from a city perspective. When we when we think about safety, it's like what what are we actually optimizing for? Are we optimizing for the largest revenue that's coming back? That's where the mobility as a service business is. But are we are we optimizing for safety? And what information can we get from these edge sensors, these cars that know about their environment, know where all the objects are in the environment? What are we doing to learn from that data that's been acquired for driving road safety? At the moment, the, well, you know, 95% of accidents are caused by humans. How many accidents have been avoided by humans every day? <laughs> There's no data on that. There's no statistics on that. We have cars that are going to come onto the roads, which will be acquiring all that information. So it'll be able to provide information back for insurance companies, but for cities to try and manage those risks. And I think that's something that, as an industry, if we have 100 billion pouring into it, some of that should be focused on safety. And, and, and just to add about the, the, the city role, I mean, like we're, we're very encouraged to see that, that cities, you know, typically you, you could portray cities and governments as uh, slightly bureaucratic and, and sort of following the fast technology trends. Uh, but in this case, we see actually some cities that are ahead of the startup curve. Uh, when you see uh, Madrid that says, you know, uh, all of a sudden we're, we're not uh, allowing our fuel emissions inside the city center, uh, that is a radical movement. And so this is actually a fantastic mobility market where even the governments and the cities will play a key role in allowing uh, autonomy to happen. I, I, I often make the joke, like, you know, mayors up for election, all, see, all of a sudden see uh, mobility as, hey, that, that's a good ticket for me to get reelected, right? And when, when, it, when it becomes that sexy... Then, then all of a sudden. Well, now it's funny you should say that, especially coming from uh, the neighborhood that you come from, with uh, Gilets Jaunes and this, uh, you know, people fighting for their cars and fighting against fuel tax and uh, and then using it as an excuse to you know burn cars in the street or whatever. But uh, you know, uh, vehicles are this in incredible economic asset that governments fight over. I mean, one of the first things Trump did was institute tariffs on cars. Um, but at the same time, cities are limiting the kinds of cars or determining the kind of transportation environment they want to have. I think the only problem that they're they're wrestling with right now is uh, almost all of the transportation uh, modes that are currently at their disposal are are overloaded. There's no there's no uh, solution. Yeah, I think it's about sharing the data that's coming from those cars as well. So I think there's cities in the U.S. where they're saying yes, you can deploy your fleet. But that data has to be shared. It has to be open. And then we can get the universities to do research against that. And okay. it has to be a data-driven economy in a way. But that needs data to be shared to enable that. On that note, I'm going to give Alain the last word uh, as a representative of the Well, you know, the, the answer is shared community. ride. 
okay, you put two people in a car instead of one, you reduce VMT in half. You reduce greenhouse gases in half. You reduce energy in half. You reduce EV energy requirements in half. It's all about ride sharing, how we get that. Now, if he can create an environment in the car such that we'll love to ride together and I won't, you know, say, hell, I'm not riding with him. And, you know, I mean, that's what I want to get him to do. Well, let's make a distinction, not, not ride sharing, but, you know, the kinds of vehicles that I think, you know, uh, rides, ride cell and uh, best mile are enabling, you know, with multiple people, not just the driver and the passenger, oh, right? No, the, the yeah. The we need right pulling. Pulling is key. Okay. Any other last thoughts or are we done? Okay. Please thank these experts for their thoughts. <laughs>